on border security. Um, I, I did have a lot of slides on this subject and I've decided that I'm only going to show a few of them because I think it's important. There hasn't really been much discussion. In fact, there wasn't any discussion after the last session um, because I've been talking too much. So uh, I just wanted to show you a few things and I'm pretty sure in this state especially, I think there's a really great level of awareness about the linkage between soil health and well, basically, you know, how water moves in the landscape. But, you know, it's really important that we don't just focus on one thing. And I guess that's really been the theme of everything that I've been talking about this morning, that everything is interconnected. So when we're talking about water, we obviously, like, it's connected to, to plants, to soils, microbiology, hydrology, or a global climate, all of those things. Um, I mean, it, it's really extraordinary, the things that I see happen, like, at the policy level, uh, for example, in something like climate change, where everyone is just absolutely focused on carbon dioxide. Like, really talk about tunnel vision, it blows my mind that it is so reductionist and so single factor. Do you think one single factor controls global climate? There is not one single factor that controls anything, <laughs> let alone global climate. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later when we talk about carbon. So these things can't be, uh, none of these things can be considered in, in isolation, so everything is connected. So I guess when we're talking about you know, the impacts that we've had on the water cycle, you know, the questions we have to ask is really what has changed since European settlement and there's been fundamental change in so many things. We have hugely simplified the landscape, absolutely hugely in terms of the number of plants and animals and insects, as I mentioned. You know, um, Jonathan Nunwin saying that there's an insect apocalypse. 70% of insects have become extinct in the last 27 years. Probably a couple hundred years ago, we, <laughs> we probably lost 70% of our ground cover plants and we don't even know what they were. Um, and, and of course, animal diversity is hugely reduced as well. So we know we've simplified the landscape, um, we've reduced the diversity of plants, and as a result, we have hugely simplified the soil microbiome in the same way in the human health uh, scenario we have hugely simplified our gut microbiome simply by um, not consuming a wide range of foods but in the soil sense because of these things simplification um, and the effect that that's had on the microbiome we have um, had a huge impact on soil structure as well as other things we've obviously had an impact through aggressive tillage and those kinds of things, but I think people have forgotten about the soil microbiome to some extent. And this poor structure has, you know, we, I mean, we're seeing poor structure in areas that have never ever been cultivated, right? There'd be many areas in rangelands in the in New Mexico that have never seen a plough, um, but still have very compacted soil. So they've lost their structure because they've lost their microbial diversity, because they've lost plant diversity, and that comes often comes back to grazing management. But when we have poor structure, we have poor infiltration, high levels of evaporation and lower levels of soil moisture, all of which you experience in this state. And yeah, this is where the, um, where did Daniel move to? We've all been rearranged now. I knew where everyone was sitting to start with and they were like, oh, there you are. <laughs> I'm on my right hand side, perfect, wonderful. <laughs> um, yeah, so you could probably explain this a lot, a lot better than I can. But um, I, I just love these things. So the idea of those of you who've never, who has not ever seen um, this, what, the um, what, soil rainfall simulator, soil rainfall, uh, soil rainfall simulator. Who has never seen a rainfall simulator? Okay, you need to make an effort to go somewhere and see one, <laughs> um, because what it is showing you is the differences in cover. Um, soil structure, all those sorts of things, like how it's such, a, like the effective use of rainfall is something we probably don't talk about enough. You know, if one inch of rain falls, what actually happens to it? Did it all just run off or did it sit on top of the soil and evaporate or did it infiltrate really quickly? How deep did it go down into the soil? So what we want for us effective landscape function for, for our rivers to be able to continue flowing, for perennial stream flow in our rivers and um, for our transmissive aquifers to be recharged so that springs flow, but also to get water deep into the soil so that plants can then use it later when 
you know, after a rainfall event, we want our plants to remain green for as long as possible. We actually want infiltration. So if you look at the, what side is that on your left? Okay, so we've got uh, good ground cover there, and the, um, does the simulator it applies an inch or two inches or something? Yeah. Or what did you decide? You but you normally, yeah. no, what do you think in that case? Inch to inch well, inch yeah, maybe when you look at the water. Ah, yeah. uh, okay. Will, will we say yeah. two inches in that case, do you think, when you look at what's in those jars? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So the rainfall simulator, so we've got all those different kinds of amounts of ground cover and different soil structure. We're just going to apply um, something that's it's going to simulate rainfall. It's going to move backwards and forwards across the top of those trays and apply an inch of rainfall to all of them at the same time. So what you're seeing is that the one on the left-hand side, that whole inch or two inches of whatever it was, it's all infiltrated. So you see the jars underneath that are collecting that water and there's like a little spout at the front there. So that jar at the front on the left-hand side hasn't got any water in it. So none of the water that hit that well-covered ground has run off. So the farmer has kept it all on his soil. And not only that, but it's infiltrated really well. It means it's, we want to get it away from the soil surface because if it's near the soil surface, it's going to evaporate. We want to get it down deep where roots can use it. And we actually want to encourage roots to go deeper and deeper in the soil because they're going to build deeper soil. So it, on the left-hand side, you can see that the water has infiltrated really well and it's clear, or relatively clear. So it hasn't got much dissolved, it hasn't got really anything that, it hasn't taken anything out of the soil, it's just the water has gone through. The extreme case on your right hand side, none of the water infiltrated, the jar that's underneath the soil has no water in it. It has all run off and it's taken sediment with it. It's taken nutrients with it. Probably taken a whole lot of microbes if there was any, I guess, living near the soil surface with it. But what is that going to do to the to the river system that that water flows into? It's going to eutrophy that water. It's going. To, we're going to end up with, you know, like Lake Erie, for example, like massive algal blooms and all kinds of things. Because if that farmer used phosphorus, and I bet they did, and they'd lost soil, they're going to lose the phosphorus that they applied. Because where did they put the phosphorus? As a general, on the surface. Right, so it's all going to end up in the water, it's going to call, cause algal blooms, it's going to cause all kinds of issues in the water. We don't want that stuff in the water. We want to keep the soil and all the nutrients and everything on the land. And if we want a perennial stream flow, if we want our rivers and streams to run all year as they used to, many of them used to prior to European settlement, then we have to have recharge of transmissive aquifers. We have to have clear water going down, recharging the springs. Our rivers are supposed to run from springs. They're not supposed to run from overland flow because when we get overland flow, that's when we get all the rubbish in our rivers. And then we didn't keep the water on the land where we need it. So I think the rainfall simulator is a fantastic way of showing that. In between those two extremes, we have various levels, in this case, I guess it's a cropping example and there's various levels of crop residues on the surface and there's probably tillage. Some of it's probably minimum till with maximum you know, crop residue retention and then the other side I guess is going to be, in this case, probably heavily tilled with no surface cover but just showing, basically demonstrating I guess the five soil health principles or at least some of them um, in terms of soil cover. But you know, it makes a huge amount of difference how, and that, that's all of that's management. All of that is how we manage our cropland, how we manage our rangeland. We can impact hugely on how water moves in the landscape and also on our productivity, on our farm or on our ranch as to like how much water we keep there. It's, it's the basis of our production. Water is probably the most limiting factor for production in this environment, right? So you want to harvest every drop of rainfall that you possibly can. So if we look at this in a historical context, so I was just going to show you a couple of images from Australia. I know some of you have seen this before, but there has been a dramatic change in landscape function in Australia. Um, and I, that's something that I have like lots of information on. So the first, one of the first white people to see land in Australia was George Augustus Robinson back in the 1840s. He was the chief protector of Aborigines. His job was to protect Aboriginal people from the um, pioneering colonists, the invaders, whatever you want to call them, the white people that were coming into Aboriginal country. And so George Augustus Robinson's job was to protect Aboriginal people. And every day he kept a daily journal 
of just really what he saw. The groups of people that he met, conversations that he had with people, what sorts of things were going on, and also just the landscape. The landscape that he was moving through is so we had a horse and cart. He uh, had a couple of men with him. And uh, even some of the observations he makes about they would camp each night, you know, sometimes near a little river or stream or something, and always were able to catch abundant fish or eels or, um, you know, the rivers were full of life. There was so much food in that landscape. Many of those rivers that he describes, the wetlands that he describes back in 1840, they're not there now. The wetlands have dried up, the rivers don't run anymore. So, of course, they haven't got fish in them anymore because, you know, the way water moves in that landscape has changed. The other thing is, where he was in the southern half of Australia, in Victoria, if any of those are familiar with Australia, is a Mediterranean climate, like uh, southern California, for example. So, it has a very hot, dry summer and a moist, cool, moist winter. Now, what George Augustus Robinson noted in his diaries, he was the chief protector of Aborigines for about 10 years was that every summer in Victoria, when it didn't rain, he had entries in his diary like, still green after 90 days with no rain and temperatures above 100 degrees. It will just be some note about everything that he looked, everywhere he looked, it was green. And he also talked about the carpets of colourful wildflowers and the fact that Aboriginal people were harvesting uh, like tubers off a lot of those flowers, but that's where they got their starches from their um, carbohydrates from the tubers of those flowers, the flowers which then subsequently sheep loved to eat and cattle loved to eat and now are no longer in that landscape. And so he was talking about a hydrated landscape in a Mediterranean climate when it didn't rain for months on end in summer. Everything was green. <laughs> so how could that be? How can you go for months and months and months with no rain and everything be green? Well, if you could store a lot of water in that soil when it does rain in wintertime, then of course there is <coughs> plenty of moisture for plants to grow over summer. So it is very clearly all about getting water into the soil and storing it in the soil, which is going to relate to its carbon content, because that's going to be the thing that is going to um, enable good infiltration and good storage. He also talked about how soft the soil was and the fact that you could easily push a stick. He often commented that. You can just take a stick and you can push it into the ground, two feet into the ground easily. That two foot of soil is probably gone now. But when you think about the um, Aboriginal women that were harvesting the tubers on the flowers, just using a digging stick, and, and quite easily just going about the business, like he, he would say that in three hours, they could collect enough tubers, they would put them in a pile in the shade under a tree, and there will be enough food there for three days. They only had to do it once, like every three days. There's plenty of time for sitting around the campfire or um, playing with your kids in the river or whatever. You know, like people had a lot more time in those days because it was easy to collect food and there was abundant food. And we had a very high Aboriginal population. Uh, we probably couldn't, if the same number of white people now had to go out and live in that landscape and survive on it, well, they would perish because, you know, the food is just not there now. Like, there has been a big change. Anyway, deep soft soil, colourful wildflowers, remaining green, hydrated over summer, even though it's hot and dry. And these are some paintings that were done in the <coughs> colonial period. This one's 1858. So this area was only really, like, settled in about 1840. You'll see that there's no trees there. I have real issues now with all the fires that we have in Australia because we did not have a treed landscape. The trees that are there, where the houses are, are introduced trees from England. They're poplars that have just been planted in the line along the road that comes into the house. The original uh, explorers talked about the hills being there and, and everything was basically, they called that a grassland, but actually it was a herbland. And, um, and that's where all the flowers were. So this is summertime and it's green and there's not very many trees. Now we have a landscape that's full of trees that burn and we wonder why we have wildlife. Um, this is another one taken in the middle, this is in the middle of summer. And you see the trees there are poplar trees and of course the sheep, which preferentially ate the flowers. So we ended up with grasses. Um, and, and that was why, why we also ended up with trees because there's a lot of bare ground created through inappropriate grazing management and um, and the trees colonised that, that um, bare ground. So 1860, 
So then another person that collected some interesting information in the early settlement days in Australia was uh, Sir Paul Edmund Strzelecki, who was a Polish geologist and explorer who came to Australia. He was actually looking for gold, um, but he was very, very interested in the soils as well, and he noticed that some of the soils that people were farming were much more productive than others. So he collected some soil samples, sent them back to Kew in England. Kew was, uh, K-E-W, was where the herbarium was and also where um, it was sort of kind of like when most scientific studies were undertaken. So he sent these soil samples back in uh, 18, uh, 1843. So he, he had collected 41 samples over that period, that seven year, per, um, four year period there, and then sent them all back on a sailing ship back to England and got them analysed. So what they found was that the highest ranking soils actually had organic matter levels between 11 and 37%. Now in Australia, most of our soils have organic matter levels less than 1%, probably a little bit like New Mexico. Right? So we had incredibly high levels of organic matter. So we had this amazingly green, hydrated, diverse landscape with deep, soft soils that were high in carbon. And where have they all gone? They're not there now. <laughs> so even the lowest ranking soils had organic matter levels from 2.2 to 5, 5%. <coughs> And this was the key point that I wanted to make from this. When you took the average of the highest group, the 10 highest ranking soils, and compared that to the average of the 10 lowest ranking soils, and then they looked in the lab, they actually looked at their water holding capacity, found an 18-fold difference in water holding capacity between the highest to the lowest ranking soils just on, in terms of their carbon content. So if he found, like quite separately from what George Augustus Robinson was just reporting in a daily journal that, hey, this is really green and, and diverse and, and beautiful deep soils and lots of abundance of food here. And then we've got somebody else coming for a different reason, actually looking for gold, but sending the samples back to England and going, you know, there's an 18-fold difference in water homing capacity of the low carbon compared to the high carbon soils. So now that our carbon levels have gone down to below 1%, you can imagine that our water holding capacity, the difference is, is like even greater. It makes a huge difference. And that's why landscape function has changed incredibly. Um, not only do we now have trees that have invaded what was a herd land, um, those trees are highly flammable. Eucalyptus trees have very, very high levels of oil. When you look at the pollen record, they were quite rare at the time of European settlement, but they were the thing that was able to grow in bare ground and the, able, the thing that was able to colonise the land. We have a landscape that's no longer hydrated. When it rains, the water runs off. So we have this boom-bust situation. We have trees where we didn't have trees before, and people wonder why we have fires. Um, I'm going to talk about carbon a little bit later today, and I'm going to show you a photo. We've had massive dust storms in Australia this year. Absolutely incredible. Just like the dust storms that you had way, way back in the 1930s. Like, what have we learned? Nothing, really. And, um, yeah, so I was going to show you some other slides, but I'm going to leave it there because I think there's enough information there that, you know, the way that we manage land is going to be related to how much carbon it has in it, and that is going to be related to how water moves in that landscape. Oh, I will just say one thing about the, the recent fires, and I'm sure you're all aware of. It's now raining and it's flooding like you wouldn't believe it. So we've gone from drought to flood, and we are just going to keep going from drought to flood till we figure out about how to restore the integrity of our soils and, um, you know, basically regenerate our landscape so that we get proper landscape function again. Um, so, yeah, I'll leave it to you, Rob.